Hello and welcome to Mythology Explained, the channel where we dive into the fascinating stories and legends of different cultures. In this video, we will explore the essential stories of Norse mythology, from the creation of the world to the prophecy of Ragnarok. Norse mythology is the collective name for the myths and legends of the ancient Scandinavian people, who worshipped a pantheon of gods led by Odin, the All-Father. These stories are rich in symbolism, adventure, and drama, and have inspired many modern works of art and literature, such as The Lord of the Rings, Marvel's Thor, and Game of Thrones. If you are interested in learning more about the Norse gods, their enemies, their allies, and their destiny, then stay tuned and enjoy the video. The Norse creation myth begins with a primordial void called Janungagap, where nothing existed except fire and ice. The fire and ice met and created a giant being named Amir, the first of the frost giants. Amir was the ancestor of all the giants, who were the enemies of the gods. The first gods were Odin and his brothers, Vili and Vi. They were the sons of Bor, who was the son of Buri, who was created from a cow's lick. Odin and his brothers decided to kill Amir, and use his body to create the world. They made the earth from his flesh, the mountains from his bones, the sea from his blood, the sky from his skull, and the clouds from his brains. They also made the sun, the moon, and the stars from the sparks of the fire realm. Odin and his brothers then created a place for themselves and their descendants, the gods and goddesses. This place was called Asgard, the home of the Asir. Asgard was connected to Midgard, the home of the humans, by a rainbow bridge called Bifrost. There were also other realms, such as Jotunheim, the land of the giants, Nivelheim, the land of the dead, and Alfheim, the land of the elves. The first humans were Ask and Embla, who were created by Odin and his brothers from two pieces of wood. They gave them life, breath, intelligence, and beauty. They also gave them a place to live in Midgard, and protected them from the dangers of the other realms. This is how the world and the first gods and humans were created, according to Norse mythology. Odin was not only the god of war, but also the god of poetry, magic, and wisdom. He was always eager to learn more about the secrets of the universe, and he was willing to pay any price for it. One of his quests for wisdom led him to Mimir, the guardian of a well that contained the knowledge of the past, present, and future. Mimir was a wise being who knew many things, but he was also very cautious. He did not let anyone drink from his well without a sacrifice. When Odin asked him for a sip of the water, Mimir demanded that Odin give him one of his eyes. Odin agreed, and plucked out his own eye and threw it into the well. He then drank from the water, and gained immense insight and foresight. He could see things that others could not, and he became the wisest of all the gods and men. However, he also paid a great price for his wisdom. He lost half of his vision, and he had to wear a patch over his empty eye socket. He also became more somber and melancholic, as he knew the fate of the gods and the world. He knew that one day, a great battle called Ragnarok would destroy everything he loved, and he could not prevent it. How Loki, the trickster god, caused trouble for the gods and the dwarves, and how he ended up bringing them some of the most marvelous gifts ever made. Loki was a shapeshifter and a mischief maker, who often got himself and the other gods into trouble. He was also very clever and cunning, and sometimes he used his wits to get out of sticky situations. One of his most famous pranks involved the goddess Sif, the wife of Thor, the god of thunder. Sif was very proud of her long, golden hair, which was a symbol of her beauty and fertility. One day, while she was sleeping, Loki sneaked into her room and cut off all her hair. When she woke up, she was horrified to see herself bald, and she cried out in anger and grief. Thor was furious when he saw what had happened to his wife, and he threatened to kill Loki unless he fixed his mistake. Loki knew he had gone too far, and he promised to find a way to restore Sif's hair. He went to the realm of the dwarves, who were the best craftsmen in the Nine Worlds. He asked them to make a new hair for Sif, made of pure gold, that would grow and behave like real hair. The dwarves agreed, and they also made two other gifts for the gods, a ship called Skidbladner, that could sail on any sea and be folded up like a cloth, and a spear called Gungnir, that never missed its target. Loki was pleased with the gifts, and he decided to make a bet with another group of dwarves, who claimed to be even better craftsmen. He wagered his own head that they could not make anything more marvelous than the gifts he had already obtained. The dwarves accepted the challenge, and they started to work on their own creations. They made a golden ring called Dropner, that produced eight identical rings every nine nights, and a golden boar called Gullenbursti, that could run faster than any horse and shine like the sun. But their masterpiece was a hammer called Mjolnir, that could strike with the force of a thunderbolt, and return to the hand of the wielder. The hammer was so powerful that it could crush mountains and slay giants, but it had one flaw, its handle was too short, because Loki had interfered with the work of the dwarves. Loki was amazed by the gifts, and he realized that he had lost the bet. 
He tried to run away, but the dwarves caught him and demanded his head. Loki argued that they could take his head, but not his neck, because that was not part of the deal. The dwarves agreed, but they still wanted to punish him. They sewed his mouth shut with a leather strap, and left him in pain and silence. Loki returned to Asgard, the home of the gods, and presented the gifts to the gods. He gave the hair to Sif, the ship to Freyr, the god of fertility, the spear to Odin, the chief of the gods, the ring to Odin as well, the boar to Freyr, and the hammer to Thor. The gods were delighted with the gifts, and they forgave Loki for his mischief. They also removed the strap from his mouth, and let him speak again. This is how Loki caused mischief and brought gifts to the gods, according to Norse mythology. Some of the adventures and battles of Thor, the god of thunder, and his encounters with the giants, who were his enemies and rivals. Thor was the strongest and bravest of the gods, and he wielded a mighty hammer called Mjolnir, that could strike with the force of a thunderbolt, and return to his hand. He also wore a belt of strength, a pair of iron gloves, and a chariot pulled by two goats. He often went on journeys to the realm of the giants, called Jotunheim, where he fought and outwitted many of them. One of his most famous adventures involved his hammer being stolen by a giant named Thrym, who hid it deep underground. Thrym demanded that the goddess Freya, the most beautiful of the gods, marry him in exchange for the hammer. Freya refused, and the gods were worried that they would lose their most powerful weapon. Loki, the trickster god, came up with a plan to get the hammer back. He suggested that Thor dress up as Freya, and pretend to be the bride. Thor was reluctant, but he agreed, and he put on a bridal gown, a veil, and Freya's necklace. Loki disguised himself as Thor's maid, and they went to Jotunheim. Thrym was overjoyed to see his bride, and he welcomed them to his hall. He was surprised by how much Freya ate and drank, and how fierce her eyes were. Loki explained that Freya was very hungry and excited for the wedding. Thrym then brought out the hammer, and placed it on Freya's lap, as a sign of their union. Thor seized the hammer, and threw off his disguise. He then proceeded to kill Thrym and all the other giants in the hall, and returned to Asgard with his hammer and Loki. Another adventure of Thor involved him meeting a giant named Skrymir, who was so huge that he used his glove as a house. Thor and his companions, Loki and Thialfi, were traveling to Jotunheim, when they came across Skrymir sleeping in a forest. They decided to spend the night in his glove, which had a large opening. In the middle of the night, Thor was awakened by a loud snoring sound, which was Skrymir's breathing. He was annoyed, and he hit Skrymir on the head with his hammer. Skrymir woke up, and asked if a leaf had fallen on his head. He then went back to sleep. Thor tried to hit him again, harder, but Skrymir only asked if an acorn had hit him. Thor then used all his strength, and hit him a third time, but Skrymir only said that a bird had dropped something on his head. He then got up, and said that he had to leave, and gave Thor directions to the castle of Utgard Loki, the king of the giants. He also warned him not to be too arrogant, as he would meet his match there. Thor and his companions followed his advice, and went to the castle. There, they were greeted by Utgard Loki, who mocked Thor for being small and weak. He challenged him and his companions to various contests, to prove their skills and abilities. Thialfi, who was very fast, raced against a young giant named Hugi, but he lost every time. Loki, who was very hungry, competed in an eating contest against a giant named Logi, but he was outmatched by Logi, who ate not only the food, but also the plates and the table. Thor, who was very strong, tried to lift a cat off the ground, but he could only raise one paw. He then tried to drink from a horn, but he could only lower the level a little. He then wrestled with an old woman named Eli, but he could not make her budge. Utgard Loki laughed at Thor and his companions, and said that they were no match for the giants. Thor was angry, and he demanded to know the truth behind the contests. Utgard Loki then revealed that he had used illusions and magic to trick them. The giant Skrymir was actually Utgard Loki himself, and he had used a mountain as his glove. He had also protected his head with a layer of iron, which Thor had dented with his hammer blows. The young giant Hugi was actually thought, and no one could outrun him. The giant Logi was actually fire, and no one could eat more than him. The cat that Thor tried to lift was actually Jormungand, the Midgard serpent, that encircled the world, and Thor had almost caused the end of the world by lifting him. The horn that Thor tried to drink from was actually connected to the sea, and Thor had lowered the tide with his sips. The old woman Eli was actually old age, and no one could defeat her. Utgard Loki then said that he was impressed by Thor and his companions, and that he would not let them enter his castle again, as they were too dangerous. He then vanished, along with his castle, and left Thor and his companions in the wilderness. This is how Thor had adventures and battles with the giants, according to Norse mythology. Loki's monstrous children and their fate, and how they are connected to the end of the world. Loki, the trickster god, 
was a shapeshifter and a mischief maker, who often caused trouble for the gods and the giants. He was also the father of some of the most fearsome and dreadful creatures in the Nine Worlds. He had three children with a giantess named Angraboda, who lived in the realm of the giants, called Jotunheim. These children were Fenrir, a gigantic wolf, Jormungandr, a colossal serpent, and Hel, a half-living, half-dead goddess. Odin, the chief of the gods, had the power of foresight, and he could see the future events that would affect the fate of the gods and the world. He saw that Loki's children would play a major role in a great battle, called Ragnarok, that would destroy everything. He decided to take action, and he sent some of the gods to capture Loki's children and bring them to Asgard, the home of the gods. The gods managed to seize Loki's children, and they decided to deal with them in different ways. Fenrir, the wolf, was too wild and fierce to be tamed, and he grew larger and stronger every day. The gods tried to chain him up, but he broke every chain they used. They then asked the dwarves, the best craftsmen in the Nine Worlds, to make a special fetter, called Gleipnir, that was made of six impossible things, the sound of a cat's footstep, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spit of a bird. The fetter looked like a thin ribbon, but it was very strong and magical. The gods brought the fetter to Fenrir, and challenged him to break it, as a test of his strength. Fenrir was suspicious, and he sensed that there was some trickery involved. He agreed to try, but only if one of the gods would put his hand in his mouth, as a sign of good faith. None of the gods dared to do so, except for Tyr, the god of war and justice, who was brave and honorable. He placed his hand in Fenrir's mouth, and the gods fastened the fetter around the wolf's legs. Fenrir struggled and tried to free himself, but the more he pulled, the tighter the fetter became. He realized that he had been tricked, and he bit off Tyr's hand. The gods then tied the fetter to a large rock, and drove a sword through Fenrir's jaws, to keep him from biting. Fenrir howled in pain and anger, and he stayed there until the day of Ragnarok. Jormungandr, the serpent, was so huge that he encircled the world, and held his own tail in his mouth. He was also known as the Midgard Serpent, as he lived in the sea that surrounded Midgard, the home of the humans. The gods threw him into the ocean, and hoped that he would stay there. However, Jormungandr was a constant threat to the gods and the world, as he caused earthquakes and tidal waves with his movements. He also had a bitter enemy in Thor, the god of thunder, who had a few encounters with him. Thor once went fishing with a giant named Hymir, and he used an ox head as a bait. He hooked Jormungandr, and pulled him out of the water. He raised his hammer, Mjolnir, to strike the serpent, but Hymir cut the line, and Jormungandr sank back into the sea. Thor and Jormungandr would meet again, at the day of Ragnarok. Hel, the goddess of the dead, was a strange and gloomy being. She had a normal appearance on one half of her body, but the other half was decaying and corpse-like. She was not evil, but she was cold and indifferent to the suffering of others. The gods gave her the authority to rule over a realm of the same name, Hel, where she received the souls of those who died of old age, sickness, or other causes that were not related to battle. Those who died in combat went to Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain, where they were welcomed by Odin and the Valkyries. Hel's realm was a dark and dismal place, where the dead lived in misery and hopelessness. The entrance to Hel was guarded by a fierce hound named Garm, and a river of blood called Joel. Hel remained in her domain, until the day of Ragnarok. This is how Loki's monstrous children were captured and bound by the gods, according to Norse mythology. The origins, the signs, the events, and the aftermath of Ragnarok, as well as its cultural impact and interpretations. Ragnarok, which means either, the fate of the gods, or, the twilight of the gods, in Old Norse, is a prophecy that foretells the doom of the gods and the end of the world as we know it. The main sources of information about Ragnarok are the Poetic Edda, a collection of ancient poems from the 10th century, and the Prose Edda, a manual of Norse mythology written by the Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century. However, there are also references and allusions to Ragnarok in other poems, sagas, runestones, and artworks from the Viking Age and later periods. According to the myth, Ragnarok will be preceded by a series of signs and events that will indicate the impending doom. These include Fimbulved, the great winter that will last for three years without any summer in between. During this time, the world will be plagued by wars, famines, diseases, and moral decay. The disappearance of the sun and the moon, which will be devoured by the wolf skull and Hattie, respectively. The stars will also vanish from the sky, leaving the world in darkness. The shaking of the world tree Yggdrasil, which will cause earthquakes and release the monstrous wolf Fenrir and the serpent Jormungandr from their bonds. Fenrir is the son of the trickster god Loki and the giantess Angerboa, and Jormungandr is his brother who encircles the world in the ocean. Both of them are enemies of the gods and destined to kill them at Ragnarok. The sounding of the Hornjullerhorn by the god Heimdall, 
the watchman of the gods, who will alert the gods and the warriors in Valhalla, the hall of the slain, to prepare for the final battle. Heimdall will then face Loki in a duel to the death. The breaking of the ship Nagalfar, which is made of the nails of the dead, and the freeing of the fire giant Surtr and his army from Muspelheim, the realm of fire. They will sail across the sea to join the forces of chaos against the gods and their allies. The opening of the gates of Hel, the underworld, and the arrival of the goddess Hel, the daughter of Loki and Angerboa, and her army of the dead. She will also ally with the enemies of the gods and bring destruction to the world. The stage is now set for the final confrontation between the gods and their foes, which will take place on the plain of Vigrid. The battle will be fierce and bloody, and many of the gods and their adversaries will perish. Some of the notable duels and deaths are. Odin, the king of the gods, will fight against Fenrir, who will swallow him whole. However, Odin's son Vidar will avenge his father by tearing apart Fenrir's jaws and killing him. Thor, the god of thunder, will face Jormungandr, who will spew venom at him. Thor will manage to slay the serpent, but he will die from its poison after taking nine steps. Freyr, the god of fertility, will confront Surtr, who will wield a flaming sword that can burn anything. Freyr will be unarmed, having given his magical sword to his servant Skirner, and he will fall to Surtr's blade. Tyr, the god of war, will clash with the Hellhound Garm, who guards the entrance to Hell. They will kill each other in the fight. Loki, the god of mischief, will battle with Heimdall, the god of light. They will also slay each other in the combat. The outcome of the battle will be the destruction of the world by fire and water. Surt will set fire to the world tree Yggdrasil and everything else, while Jormungandr's thrashing will cause floods and tsunamis. The world will sink into the sea and disappear. However, this is not the end of everything. After the cataclysm, a new world will emerge from the waters, green and fertile. A few gods and goddesses will survive the Ragnarok and return to the new world, such as Odin's sons Vidar and Vali, Thor's sons Modi and Magni, and the god Baldur, who was killed by Loki's trickery before the Ragnarok and resurrected afterwards. They will find the golden chess pieces that the gods used to play with in the old world, and they will remember their past deeds and glory. The new world will also be repopulated by two human survivors, Lif and Lifthrazer, who hid themselves in the hollow of the world tree during the Ragnarok. They will emerge and become the ancestors of a new race of humans. The sun and the moon will also be reborn, as their children will take their places in the sky. The world will be peaceful and prosperous, and there will be no more evil or suffering. Ragnarok is a fascinating and complex myth that reflects the worldview and values of the Norse people. It shows their belief in the inevitability of fate, the courage and honor of the gods and heroes, and the hope for a better future after the end of the world. Ragnarok has also inspired many works of art and literature, such as the operas of Richard Wagner, the novels of J.R.R. Tolkien, the comics and movies of Marvel, and the video games of God of War. Ragnarok is a timeless and universal story that continues to captivate and intrigue us today. Thor and Loki are two of the most prominent and popular gods in the Norse pantheon. Thor is the god of thunder, strength, and protection, who wields the mighty hammer Mjolnir and defends Asgard, the realm of the gods, from the giants, the enemies of the gods. Loki is the god of mischief, trickery, and fire, who is a shapeshifter and a master of deception. He is often an ally of the gods, but also a troublemaker and a betrayer. Thor and Loki have a complex and ambivalent relationship, sometimes cooperating and sometimes competing, sometimes being friends and sometimes being foes. The story of Thor and Loki's journey to Utgard is found in the Prose Edda, a manual of Norse mythology written by the Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century. However, as we mentioned in the previous video about Ragnarok, the end of the world in Norse mythology, Snorri's version of the story is not entirely reliable, as he mixed elements from different sources, added fairy tale motifs, and altered some details to suit his own purposes. Therefore, we should not take his account as the definitive or authentic version of the myth, but rather as one possible interpretation of it. According to Snorri, the story begins with Thor and Loki traveling together in Thor's chariot, which is pulled by two goats. They stop at the house of a farmer and his family, where they offer their goats for supper, knowing that they can revive them the next day with Thor's hammer. However, the farmer's son, Jalfi, breaks one of the goat's bones to suck out the marrow, which causes the goat to be lame when Thor resurrects it. Thor is angry and demands compensation from the farmer, who gives him his two children, Jalfi and Roskva, as servants. Thor then leaves the farm with Loki and the two children, and heads to the land of the giants, Jotunheim. On their way, they encounter a vast forest, where they find a huge hall with a strange opening at one end. They decide to spend the night there, but they are disturbed by loud noises and tremors that shake the hall. Thor goes out to investigate and finds a giant sleeping and snoring nearby. 
He realizes that the hall is actually the giant's glove, and the opening is the thumb hole. He tries to kill the giant with his hammer, but the giant wakes up and introduces himself as Skrymir. He offers to travel with Thor and his companions, and they agree. Skrymir carries their luggage in his knapsack, but he ties it so tightly that Thor and Loki cannot open it to get their food. Thor becomes frustrated and attempts to smash Skrymir's head with his hammer while he is sleeping, but Skrymir only feels a slight itch. Thor tries again and again, but Skrymir remains unharmed. He thinks that an acorn or a leaf has fallen on his head, and he wonders if Thor is awake. The next day, Skrymir parts ways with Thor and his companions, and tells them how to reach the castle of Utgarda Loki, the king of the giants. He warns them not to be arrogant or boastful, as they will meet many powerful and clever giants there. Thor and his companions arrive at the castle, which is so huge that they have to squeeze through the bars of the gate. They enter the hall, where they see Utgarda Loki and his court. Utgarda Loki mocks Thor and his companions for being small and weak, and challenges them to prove their skills in various contests. The first contest is between Loki and a giant named Logi, who claims to be the fastest eater in the world. They are given a trough filled with meat, and they start eating from opposite ends. They meet in the middle, but while Loki has eaten all the meat, Logi has also eaten the bones and the trough itself. Utgarda Loki declares Logi the winner. The second contest is between Thjalfi and a giant named Hugi, who claims to be the swiftest runner in the world. They race three times, but each time Hugi is so far ahead of Thjalfi that he turns back and meets him on the way. Utgarda Loki declares Hugi the winner. The third contest is between Thor and a giant named Eli, who claims to be the strongest wrestler in the world. Thor is surprised to see that Eli is an old woman, and he thinks that he will easily defeat her. However, he soon finds out that he cannot move her at all, and she gradually forces him down to one knee. Utgarda Loki declares Eli the winner, and says that no one else in the hall will dare to wrestle with Thor. Thor is not satisfied, and he asks for another contest. He challenges anyone in the hall to drink from his horn, which he says is very easy. Utgarda Loki agrees, and gives him a horn that is connected to the ocean. Thor drinks as much as he can, but he barely lowers the level of the horn. He tries again and again, but he fails to empty the horn. Utgarda Loki says that he has done well, but not as well as he expected. Thor asks for another contest. He challenges anyone in the hall to lift his cat, which he says is very light. Utgarda Loki agrees, and gives him a cat that is actually the world serpent Jormungand in disguise. Thor tries to lift the cat, but he can only raise one of its paws. He struggles and strains, but he cannot lift the cat. Utgarda Loki says that he has done well, but not as well as he expected. Thor asks for one last contest. He challenges anyone in the hall to strike him with a blow, which he says he will not flinch from. Utgarda Loki agrees, and tells him to face his foster son, the giant Thrym, who will hit him with his iron glove. Thor agrees, but he asks for his hammer to defend himself. Utgarda Loki says that he cannot use his hammer, as it is against the rules of the contest. He tells him to stand still and take the blow. As Thor prepares to face Thrym, Utgarda Loki reveals his true identity. He says that he is actually Loki, the god of mischief, and that he has tricked Thor and his companions with his illusions and magic. He says that he was the giant Skrymir, and that he used a mountain as his head, and three valleys as the dents made by Thor's hammer. He says that he was the giant Logi, and that he was actually fire, which consumes everything. He says that he was the giant Hugi, and that he was actually thought, which is faster than anything. He says that he was the old woman Eli, and that she was actually old age, which no one can resist. He says that the horn was the ocean, and that Thor's drinking caused the tides. He says that the cat was the world serpent, and that Thor's lifting made the earth shake. He says that the iron glove was the sky, and that Thor's striking would have shattered it. Loki says that he has spared Thor and his companions from certain death, as the giants in the hall were ready to kill them if they had shown any sign of success in the contests. He says that he has also taught them a lesson, that they should not be overconfident or underestimate their enemies. He says that he hopes that they have learned something from their journey, and that they will not seek revenge on him. He then disappears, along with the hall and the giants, leaving Thor and his companions alone in the forest. Thor and Loki's journey to Utgard is a story that shows the contrast and the conflict between the gods and the giants, the order and the chaos, the reality and the illusion, the strength and the cunning, the pride and the humility. It is a story that challenges the expectations and the assumptions of the characters and the audience, and that reveals the hidden truths and the deeper meanings behind the appearances and the actions. It is a story that entertains and educates, that amuses and instructs, that mocks and respects. Thor and Loki's journey to Utgard is also a story that has inspired many works of art and literature, such as the operas of Richard Wagner, 
the novels of Neil Gaiman, the comics and movies of Marvel, and the video games of God of War. Thor and Loki's journey to Utgard is a timeless and universal story that continues to captivate and intrigue us today. Fenrir is one of the three monstrous children of Loki, the god of mischief, and Angaboa, the giantess of anguish. His siblings are Jormungandr, the world serpent, and Hel, the goddess of the dead. These children were prophesied to play a major role in Ragnarok, the end of the world and the doom of the gods. The gods, fearing their power and potential, decided to banish Jormungandr to the sea and Hel to the underworld. But they had a different plan for Fenrir, the wolf. The gods thought that they could tame Fenrir and make him their ally, so they brought him to Asgard, the realm of the gods, and raised him as one of their own. However, Fenrir grew rapidly in size and strength, and soon became too dangerous and violent for the gods to handle. Only Tyr, the god of war and justice, was brave enough to feed and care for him. The gods realized that they had to restrain Fenrir before he caused any harm to them or the world. They tried to trick him into wearing a fetter, a chain or a rope, by challenging him to test his strength and break it. They made two fetters, Lading and Dromi, and presented them to Fenrir as a game. Fenrir agreed to play along, and easily snapped both fetters with his mighty jaws. The gods then asked the dwarves, the master craftsmen of the Nine Worlds, to make a special fetter that could hold Fenrir. The dwarves made a magic rope called Gleipnir, which was thin and soft as silk, but strong and hard as iron. They made it from six impossible ingredients, the sound of a cat's footstep, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spit of a bird. The gods brought Gleipnir to Fenrir and challenged him to break it. Fenrir sensed that there was something strange and magical about the rope, and he became suspicious of the gods' intentions. He said that he would only agree to be tied with Gleipnir if one of the gods would put his hand in his mouth as a pledge of good faith. The gods were reluctant to do so, knowing that they would lose their hand if Fenrir could not break free. But Tyr, the bravest and most honorable of the gods, stepped forward and offered his hand to Fenrir. The gods then bound Fenrir with Gleipnir and tried to make it look like a joke. They laughed and taunted him, saying that he was not as strong as he thought. Fenrir struggled and strained, but he could not break the magic rope. He realized that he had been tricked, and he became furious. He bit off Tyr's hand, and blood spurted from the wound. Tyr did not cry out, but bore the pain with dignity. The gods then secured Gleipnir to a huge rock called Jijol, and drove another rock called Thviti into the ground to hold it down. They took a sword and placed it in Fenrir's mouth, with the point touching his lower jaw and the hilt his upper jaw, to prevent him from closing his mouth. Fenrir howled and roared, and saliva dripped from his mouth, forming a river called Von. The gods left Fenrir bound and gagged, and rejoiced in their victory. But they also mourned the loss of Tyr's hand, and feared the day when Fenrir would break free and seek his revenge. For they knew that Fenrir's binding was not a permanent solution, but only a temporary delay of the inevitable fate of Ragnarok. The story of the binding of Fenrir is a story that shows the conflict and the balance between order and chaos, between the gods and the giants, between fate and free will. It is a story that illustrates the courage and the sacrifice of the gods, as well as their fear and their deception. It is a story that foreshadows the doom of the gods and the end of the world, as well as the hope for a new beginning. The Binding of Fenrir is also a story that has inspired many works of art and literature, such as the operas of Richard Wagner, the novels of Neil Gaiman, the comics and movies of Marvel, and the video games of God of War. The Binding of Fenrir is a timeless and universal story that continues to captivate and intrigue us today. Baldur is the son of Odin, the king of the gods, and Frigg, the queen of the gods. He is the god of light, joy, purity, and peace. He is the most loved and admired among the gods and the mortals for his radiance, wisdom, and kindness. He lives in a palace called Bradablik, which means broad gleaming, with his wife Nana, the goddess of flowers and love. He is the epitome of everything good and noble in the world. 
However, Balder starts to have disturbing dreams and visions, which foretell his imminent death. He shares his fears with the other gods, who are alarmed and saddened by this prophecy. They consult the Norns, the goddesses of fate, who confirm that Balder's doom is inevitable, and that it will be the first sign of Ragnarok, the end of the world and the doom of the gods. Frigg, who loves her son more than anything, decides to do everything in her power to prevent his death. She travels through the nine worlds, and asks every living and non-living thing to swear an oath not to harm Balder. She receives the promise of everything, from the animals and plants, to the rocks and metals, to the elements and forces of nature. She is confident that she has made Balder invulnerable to any harm. The gods, who are relieved and happy by Frigg's achievement, decide to celebrate Balder's immunity by playing a game. They gather in the field of Ida and throw various objects at Balder, such as stones, arrows, spears, and axes. They are amazed and delighted to see that nothing can hurt Balder, as everything bounces off him or falls to the ground. Balder smiles and laughs, enjoying the game and the company of his friends. However, not everyone is pleased by Balder's invincibility. Loki, the god of mischief and fire, who is the son of a giant and the blood brother of Odin, is jealous and resentful of Balder. He is always looking for ways to cause trouble and chaos among the gods, and he sees an opportunity to ruin their happiness. He disguises himself as an old woman, and approaches Frigg, who is watching the game. He pretends to be curious and confused, and asks Frigg why the gods are throwing things at Balder. Frigg explains that it is a game, and that nothing can harm Balder, because she has made everything swear not to hurt him. Loki then asks if she has made everything swear, and Frigg admits that there is one thing that she has not asked, because she thought it was too small and harmless to matter. That thing is the mistletoe, a plant that grows on the branches of trees. Loki thanks Frigg for the information, and leaves. He then goes to find a mistletoe, and plucks a sprig from a tree. He shapes it into a dart, and returns to the field of Ida. He sees that the gods are still playing the game, and that among them is Hodder, the god of winter and darkness, who is the brother of Balder. Hodder is blind, and he cannot participate in the game. Loki decides to use him as his instrument of evil. He goes to Hodder, and offers to help him join the game. He tells him that he has a dart that he can throw at Balder, and that he will guide his aim. Hodder, who trusts Loki and wants to play with his brother, agrees. Loki places the mistletoe dart in Hodder's hand and directs him to throw it at Balder. The dart flies through the air and pierces Balder's chest. Balder falls to the ground, dead. The gods are shocked and horrified by what they have witnessed. They cry out in grief and anger and turn to Loki and Hodder. Loki flees, knowing that he has committed the worst crime possible and that he will face the wrath of the gods. Hodder stands still, unaware of what he has done, and asks for an explanation. The gods tell him that he has killed his brother, and that he has been deceived by Loki. Hodder is filled with remorse and sorrow, and accepts his punishment. The gods then try to revive Balder, but they fail. They realize that he is truly dead, and that nothing can bring him back. They prepare to bury him, and to honor his memory. They place his body on a ship, along with his wife Nana, who dies of a broken heart, and his horse and his treasures. They set the ship on fire, and push it into the sea. The flames light up the sky, and the smoke rises to the heavens. The gods weep and mourn, and the world becomes darker and colder. The death of Balder is a story that shows the fragility and the beauty of life, the power and the limits of love, the consequences and the inevitability of fate. It is a story that marks the beginning of the end, the decline and the fall of the gods, the onset and the approach of Ragnarok. Loki is the son of a giant and the blood brother of Odin, the king of the gods. He is the god of fire, trickery, and shape-shifting. He is often an ally of the gods, but also a troublemaker and a betrayer. He is responsible for many of the misfortunes and conflicts that plague the gods and the world, such as the theft of Thor's hammer, the kidnapping of Idun, and the binding of Fenrir. But his most heinous crime is the contriving of the death of Balder, the god of light and joy, who was the most beloved among the gods and the mortals. 
Baldur was killed by a mistletoe dart thrown by his blind brother Odr, who was deceived by Loki. The death of Baldur was the first sign of Ragnarok, the end of the world and the doom of the gods. The gods were enraged and saddened by this tragedy, and they sought to capture and punish Loki for his evil deed. Loki fled from Asgard, the realm of the gods, and hid himself in various places. He used his magic and cunning to evade and trick the gods, who pursued him relentlessly. The main source of information about Loki's punishment and escape is the Prose Edda, a manual of Norse mythology written by the Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century. However, as we mentioned in the previous videos about Ragnarok and the Binding of Fenrir, Snorri's version of the story is not entirely reliable, as he mixed elements from different sources, added fairy tale motifs, and altered some details to suit his own purposes. Therefore, we should not take his account as the definitive or authentic version of the myth, but rather as one possible interpretation of it. According to Snorri, the story begins with Loki hiding in a mountain, where he built a house with four doors so that he could watch for his pursuers from all directions. During the day, he turned himself into a salmon and hid in a waterfall. During the night, he sat by the fire and made a fishing net. The far-seeing Odin perceived where Loki was, and the gods went after him. When Loki saw them coming, he threw the net in the fire and jumped into the water. The gods found the net in the ashes, and realized that Loki had turned himself into a fish. They made their own net, and tried to catch him in the waterfall. Loki escaped several times, but at last, he was caught by Thor, who grabbed him by the tail. This is why, to this day, the salmon has a slender tail. The gods then took Loki to a cave, where they bound him with the entrails of his son Narfi, who was killed by his brother Vali, who was turned into a wolf by the gods. They placed a poisonous snake above Loki's head, which dripped venom on his face. Loki's faithful wife, Sijin, stayed by his side and held a bowl to catch the venom. But every so often, the bowl became full, and Sijin had to empty it. When she did, the venom fell on Loki's face, and he writhed in pain, causing earthquakes. The gods left Loki in this state, and waited for the day of Ragnarok, when he would break free and fight against them. However, Snorri also tells us that Loki did not remain bound forever, but managed to escape before Ragnarok. He says that after three long winters, Loki broke his chains and fled from the cave. He then disguised himself as a woman, and went to the land of the giants, where he met the giantess Angerboa, his former lover and the mother of his monstrous children. She told him that his son Fenrir, the wolf, and his daughter Hel, the goddess of the dead, were ready to join him in the final battle against the gods. She also gave him a magic ship, called Nagalfar, which was made of the nails of the dead, and which would carry the army of the giants to Asgard. Loki then sailed to the island of Lingvi, where he met with the fire giant Surg, who wielded a flaming sword that could burn anything. Surg told him that he and his followers from Muspelheim, the realm of fire, were also ready to join him in the final battle against the gods. He also gave him a magic horn, called Jullerhorn, which could be heard throughout the nine worlds, and which would signal the start of Ragnarok. Loki then blew the horn, and the world shook. The gods heard the horn, and realized that Loki had escaped and that Ragnarok had begun. They prepared for the final confrontation, and gathered their allies. Odin rode his eight-legged horse, Sleipnir, and led the warriors of Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain. Thor rode his chariot, pulled by two goats, and wielded his hammer, Mjolnir. Freyr rode his boar, Gullinbursti, and fought without his sword, which he had given to his servant. Heimdall rode his horse, Gultop, and blew his horn, called Heimdall's horn, which could also be heard throughout the nine worlds. Tyr fought with one hand, which he had lost to Fenrir. And many other gods and heroes joined them in the battle. Loki then sailed his ship, and led the army of the giants. Fenrir ran with his mouth wide open, and devoured everything in his path. Jormungand, the world serpent, emerged from the sea, and spewed venom at the sky. Hel came with her army of the dead, and brought disease and decay. Surtur came with his army of fire, and set everything ablaze. And many other giants and monsters joined them in the battle. The battle took place on the plain of Vigrid, where the gods and the giants met in a fierce and bloody combat. Many of the gods and their adversaries perished in the fight. Some of the notable duels and deaths are. Odin fought against Fenrir, who swallowed him whole. However, Odin's son Vidar avenged his father by tearing apart Fenrir's jaws and killing him. Thor fought against Jormungand, who spewed venom at him. Thor managed to slay the serpent, but he died from its poison after taking nine steps. Freyr fought against Surtur, who wielded a flaming sword that could burn anything. Freyr was unarmed, having given his sword to his servant, and he fell to Surtur's blade. Tyr fought against the Hellhound Garm, who guarded the entrance to Hell. They killed each other in the fight. Loki fought against Heimdall, the Watchman of the Gods. They also killed each other in the combat. 
The outcome of the battle was the destruction of the world by fire and water. Surge set fire to the world tree, Yggdrasil, and everything else. Jormungand's thrashing caused floods and tsunamis. The world sank into the sea and disappeared. However, this was not the end of everything. After the cataclysm, a new world emerged from the waters, green and fertile. A few gods and goddesses survived the Ragnarok and returned to the new world, such as Odin's sons Vidar and Vali, Thor's sons Modi and Magni, and the god Baldr, who was killed by Loki's trickery before the Ragnarok and resurrected afterwards. They found the golden chess pieces that the gods used to play with in the old world, and they remembered their past deeds and glory. The new world was also repopulated by two human survivors, Lif and Lifthrazer, who hid themselves in the hollow of the world tree during the Ragnarok. They emerged and became the ancestors of a new race of humans. The sun and the moon were also reborn, as their children took their places in the sky. The world was peaceful and prosperous, and there was no more evil or suffering. Loki's punishment and escape is a story that shows the cunning and the malice of the god of mischief, as well as his role in the downfall and the renewal of the world. It is a story that depicts the wrath and the mercy of the gods, as well as their fate and their legacy. It is a story that concludes the cycle of the myths and the legends of the Norse people, as well as their worldview and their values. Loki's punishment and escape is also a story that has inspired many works of art and literature. Loki's punishment and escape is a timeless and universal story that continues to captivate and intrigue us today. Ragnarok, which means either Destiny of the Gods or Twilight of the Gods in Old Norse, is a series of prophesied events that will bring about the destruction of the Nine Realms, the death of most of the gods and their enemies, and the emergence of a new world from the ashes. The main sources for our knowledge of Ragnarok are the Poetic Edda, a collection of ancient poems, and the Prose Edda, a 13th-century manual of Norse mythology written by Snorri Sturluson. According to these sources, Ragnarok will be preceded by a long and harsh winter, known as Fimblewinter, during which the moral fabric of society will unravel and wars and crimes will abound. The sun and the moon will be devoured by two monstrous wolves, Skoll and Hattie, plunging the world into darkness. The world tree Yggdrasil, which connects the nine realms, will shake and tremble, causing earthquakes and landslides. The great wolf Fenrir, the serpent Jormungand, and the fire giant Surt, who have been bound or banished by the gods, will break free and lead an army of giants, monsters, and the undead against the gods and their allies. The god Heimdall, the watchman of the gods, will blow his horn Jillarhorn to warn the gods of the impending doom and summon them to the final battle. The battle will take place on the plain of Vigrid, where the gods and their enemies will clash in a fierce and bloody fight. Odin, the king of the gods, will face Fenrir, who will swallow him whole. Odin's son Vidar will avenge his father by tearing Fenrir's jaws apart. Thor, the god of thunder, will kill Jormungand with his hammer Mjolnir, but will die from the serpent's venom. Loki, the trickster god who betrayed the gods and joined the forces of chaos, will fight Heimdall, and they will kill each other. Tyr, the god of war, will fall to the Houndgarm, the guardian of the underworld. Freyr, the god of fertility, will be slain by Surtr, who will then set fire to the world with his flaming sword. Only a few gods, such as Odin's sons Baldur and Hod, who will return from the dead, and Thor's sons Magni and Modi, who will inherit Mjolnir, will survive the cataclysm. The world will then sink into the sea, but it will rise again, cleansed and fertile. A new generation of gods will dwell in a hall roofed with gold, and two human survivors, Lif and Lifthrazer, will repopulate the earth. A new sun, the daughter of the old one, will shine brightly in the sky, and a new era of peace and harmony will begin. The final battle and the new world that will emerge after the destruction of the Nine Realms. The final battle of Ragnarok will take place on the plain of Vigrid, where the gods and their enemies will meet in a fierce and bloody fight. The god Freyr, the lord of fertility and prosperity, will face the fire giant Surt, the ruler of Muspelheim, the realm of fire. Freyr will be at a disadvantage, as he gave away his magical sword to his servant Skirner, who used it to win the hand of the giantess Gerd for Freyr. Surt will kill Freyr with his flaming sword, which can set the world on fire. The god Tyr, the god of war and justice, will fight the Houndgarn, the guardian of hell, the realm of the dead. Tyr will be handicapped, as he lost his right hand when he bound the wolf Fenrir, the son of Loki, who will play a key role in Ragnarok. Tyr and Garm will kill each other in the battle. The god Thor, the god of thunder and the protector of mankind, will confront the serpent Jormungand, the son of Loki, who encircles the world in the ocean. Thor and Jormungand have been enemies since Thor tried to fish the serpent out of the water. Thor will kill Jormungand with his hammer Mjolnir, but he will only be able to take nine steps before he dies from the serpent's venom. 
the god Odin, the king of the gods and the god of wisdom and magic, will face the wolf Fenrir, the son of Loki, who grew so large and powerful that the gods had to bind him with a magic chain made by the dwarves. Fenrir will break free from his chain and swallow Odin whole. Odin's son Vidar, the god of vengeance and silence, will avenge his father by killing Fenrir. Vidar will use his ironshod shoe, which he has been saving for this moment, to tear Fenrir's jaws apart. The god Loki, the trickster god who betrayed the gods and joined the forces of chaos, will fight the god Heimdall, the watchman of the gods and the keeper of the Hornjullerhorn, which he used to warn the gods of the impending doom. Loki and Heimdall have been enemies since Loki stole the necklace of the goddess Freya, which Heimdall recovered. Loki and Heimdall will kill each other in the battle. The fire giant Surtr, who killed Freyr, will then use his sword to set fire to the world, burning everything to ashes. The world will then sink into the sea, but it will not be the end of everything. A new world will rise from the water, cleansed and fertile. A new generation of gods will inhabit the world, led by Odin's sons Baldur and Hod, who will return from the dead, and Thor's sons Magni and Modi, who will inherit Mjolnir. Two human survivors, Lif and Lifthrazer, who hid in the world tree Yggdrasil during the Cataclysm, will repopulate the earth. A new sun, the daughter of the old one, will shine brightly in the sky, and a new era of peace and harmony will begin.